The following interview was conducted with Professor uh, F. Tom Turpin, uh, Professor of en en Etymology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, March 25, 2009 at his office on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Professor Turpin. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming over. Okay. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was uh, born in uh, in the state of Kansas, near uh, near Troy, it's just across the river from St. Joe, Missouri, uh, on a farm. Uh, in fact, uh, I was born in our home uh, at that point, and my father always uh, sort of recounted the story that uh, that he was present at my birth and he was present at my sister's birth, and then I have a we have a younger brother, and by that time. Uh, verse were in the hospital and uh, they would not let him be in the uh, in the delivery room at, at that point because times have changed and uh, and I always remarked that well by the time my children were born w the thing to do was be back in the delivery room so my mother always pointed out that uh, that the house they lived in at that point was very close to the uh, to the cemetery so in case uh, that it wasn't a successful uh, birth that they didn't have far to go to bury me so what kind of farm did your father have? It was a it was a mixed farm. It uh, the area is very much uh, like Indiana in terms of rainfall. So we grew wheat, we grew uh, corn, and in in the later years soybeans, and and had a major uh, a livestock operation, uh, the cattle and hogs, and uh, and actually this is in an area where at one point uh, much of the land was used for orchards. Uh, that county. Uh, was the, one of the largest apple growing counties in the nation up until um, the 1940s when most of that kind of operation uh, moved west and, and so the land was turned into to corn and soybean ground, but, but a general farm. Okay. What did you go to grade school and tell about grade school and high school, what, uh, what that was like? Well, the grade school was, uh, I should have actually gone to a, a one room school. Uh, it was it was called Zimmerman Number Twenty School in Northeast Kansas, and but my father was a little more progressive, uh, and he decided that that if you're going to get a good education, you probably didn't want to start in a one-room school. So there was a, a a little school near us in the town of Bendina. It was about um, three, uh, actually a little less than three miles away, and so he decided rather than me going to the little one-room school where I should have gone that he would take me to Bendina to go to school. And so we, we teamed up with another family and they drove us to that little school, those two miles or so. And it wasn't a big school, obviously. Uh, in my, my classes along the way, there were about five students in it. However, if I'd gone to that one room school, I would have been the only one uh, and, and totally in the school maybe would have been about 10 students in the eight grades. So, so we went to Bendina uh, and ultimately, I I started uh, high school uh, in, at Bendina High School, and in my freshman class, there were five of us. And I used to uh, tell my my own children that I graduated from the eighth grade, uh, number two in my class. And and then eventually, my mother spilled the beans to uh, my my kids that there were only five of us. So they were not really uh, impressed by me graduating number two among five. And, then we were part of the consolidation that went on in those years, and our high school was consolidated with uh, three other high schools of about the same size because my high school graduating class had about 21 students in it, and this was a school called Midway, uh, and it still exists uh, in, in northeast Kansas uh, as part of the consolidation process, and now they're talking about another consolidation because these schools with, uh, you know, 120 or 130 students are no longer sure. a viable educational entity. Were any student activities that you were involved in in high school? Oh, well, when you started in, um, uh, in a school with only five in a class, everybody had to do everything. Uh, I started, uh, obviously, uh, playing sports. I was very interested in sports. Ultimately, I actually played college basketball, uh, and so coming out of that small school, it was it was kind of daunting when I moved on to uh, to a university to to uh, be a basketball player. But as a freshman, I had to I I got to play basketball, and and I can remember uh, very well that 
in those days we didn't uh, have uh, a lot of money for athletics and so uniforms were passed down from from previous teams and maybe ever five or six years they might get some new uniforms and I remember as a freshman I I was in a, high school this is in high school yeah I was a very skinny little kid I, I probably was only about five foot three and probably weighed about 130 pounds well I inherited John Henry Johnson's uniform that they had fit him when he was a senior and and John Henry Johnson was a big man. He he was like about six foot four and probably weighed about two thirty. And you can imagine that 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 uniform didn't fit very well at all. That uh, draped look. It draped. Uh, and in fact, uh, we went to the the county tournament that year. Had big county tournaments because there were a lot of schools. Uh, and and just like in the Hoosier movie, uh, we were quite uh, impressed by the junior college auditorium or a floor where we were playing. I remember I started that in that first game and it's that little bitty skinny guard and and I made a foul and the um, and the referee blew his whistle and he pointed his hand at me and then he walked over and he unfolded my jersey so he could read the number because he couldn't tell what the number was because the jersey was so large but but we learned uh, we learned to play basketball uh, you know and nice we, experience yeah and it and I I always make the point uh, and it, it kind of relates to this, uh, that my parents grew up in, uh, in the Depression. And so they grew up in a time when they were very poor. They didn't have much, and they knew it. That's, that's the way the world was. Did they have the farm, though? Uh, yes, they lived on a farm, so they had plenty of food. Uh, and even some of their relatives who maybe uh, were living in a more urban setting in a city would, uh, actually moved back, uh, and they tell the story about that. And, but the farms were able to produce at least something to eat. Sure. And so they survived, uh, although uh, the stories that I've been told over the years that my grandfather actually uh, was able to accumulate land from people who lost their land, and that ultimately became the basis for the Turpin Farm in mm -hmm. northeast Kansas. But they, ha they were poor, and they knew it. And I, I always told people that in the 50s, when I was growing up, we didn't have a lot by today's standards and uh, but it were so much better off than my parents were in the 30s that everybody was thought they had a lot of stuff we had all the new trappings and now when my family my kids came along they have everything but they they always want more they don't think they have everything so my comment has always been my parents grew up in a time when they they didn't have anything and they knew it I grew up in a time when we didn't have much but we didn't know it and my kids have grown up in a time when they have everything and they don't know it, you know? So we've just kind of changed in three generations into what the we- tra The transition. The, the transition in, in material kinds of things. Right, and, right. and when I played basketball in those days, I was lucky to have a new pair of Chuck Taylor tennis shoes uh, every year. Uh, and now uh, kids will get uh, new shoes, have four or five different pairs of shoes depending on the conditions or something. And then college come next, and where'd you go to college, and how did you decide where to go? College so came, college, yeah, college came next. Uh, when I was getting out of high school, uh, uh, some of the teachers were saying, you ought to think about going on to college. And, and I thought, well, that would be pretty good. And then as it turned out, because of athletics, uh, I had an opportunity to go to colleges. I was also a baseball pitcher. And so I ended up at Washburn University where I pitched uh, That's in Kansas, in, in Kansas, in Topeka, Kansas, and I pitched on the baseball team, and I also uh, played on the basketball team, and that helped with my education. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, although my parents were were more than willing to help with an education. They thought it was important, uh, but uh, having a scholarship uh, helped out quite a bit. So, so going to college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, a farm boy from northeast Kansas and one of my math teachers in high school who I liked quite a quite a lot and was a great teacher and and so when I was headed away from college he said well you ought to think about majoring in math you know and so I arrived at Washburn and, and he said what are you going to major in and I said well I'll major in math well as it turned out I started taking math courses and and I didn't do too well in math you know okay but uh, and, and it wasn't much fun and, but I found out my biology courses were really really pretty pretty good 
So I ended up transferring into biology, and I ended up with a math minor and a biology major then uh, at the university, but uh, I ended up as a, a biologist. Was, did you live on, you lived on campus? I lived on campus for the first couple of years, and then I eventually moved out uh, into an apartment. But yes, I lived in a, a residence hall, uh, and I can remember that that residence hall uh, in on on Friday evenings uh, our our meal facility was actually in a women's residence hall, and on Friday nights we had to dress up in a suit and tie uh, to go to those evening meals and. And I was later told by some of the administrators that, well, uh, one of the reasons we have to do that is because we have enough of you farm boys come in that, that really don't know how to eat in a dignified way. So we, we ask you to dress up and, and learn to be a little more dignified when you eat your meals. Interesting. Oh, what came next then? Did you have, uh, were you in the service at all? Did you serve in the military at all? I did not. Uh, I, I came, actually, it does. After you it, finished college, then what came it next? It does enter, in a, the military enters into my life a little bit because okay. I, uh, after I got out of college, this was in uh, 1965. Is that when you graduated? Graduated in 65. And like in high school, I was had a biology degree and, and I hadn't given much thought to maybe what happened after college. You know, I was playing basketball and playing baseball and, and going to class and, and having a good time and enjoying the whole uh, opportunity. And one of my professors at one point said, well, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I said, you know, I haven't thought about that. And this professor uh, happened to be a plant ecologist and was my advisor. And he said, you know, I think you ought to consider graduate school. And he said, I know a guy out in, in uh, Fort Hayes in Kansas who... Um, would be looking for a graduate student, and you might just be the person he'd be looking for. So you ought to consider taking the GREs and going to graduate school. And I thought, well, maybe that would be okay, you know? So, and so I went to take the GREs, and I was really lucky because I, I was having a, I had a genetics course and an ecology course at that time, and the GREs really focused heavily on that, and that was fresh on my mind. So I did pretty well in the GREs, you know? based on my academic ability. Okay. So, and so began and the to, courses. And, and the okay. courses I was taking, it was fresh in my memory. So, uh, so I did, did okay. Then when a couple other professors heard that I was considering you know, maybe graduate school, then they began to lobby for their areas. And one was a marine ecologist. And he said, have you ever thought about marine ecology? You're interested in, in ecology. And I said, no, but uh, uh, I guess I could. And he said, well, Oregon's got a great program, and he said, maybe you ought to apply out there. And then another person in our department who was an entomologist said, you know, you're a farm boy, and he said, I think you ought to major in entomology and learn how to control those insects that cause problems for farmers. He said, that'd be a perfect match for you. And I know a guy at Iowa State who is looking for a graduate student, and he wants a farm boy, and, and that would probably be good for you. So I applied to the three institutions, Oregon, Fort Hayes, and Iowa State. And I got an offer from all three of them and for an assistantship. And I was trying to decide, do I want to study marine biology, do I want to study prairie ecology, or do I want to study entomology? I never had an entomology course. But as luck would have it, one of my friends, uh, a classmate of mine, uh, actually her fiancé was at Iowa State as a graduate student. She came in one day and said, have you heard from Iowa State much? And I said, well, I've got an offer. She said, you know, um, would you like to go up with me? I'm, I'm driving up next week to see my boyfriend, and uh, I would love to have you come along, and then you could go up and visit. I said, well, that's a great opportunity. So I drove up there, and I, I met my major, it turned out to be my major professor, Don Peters. And he, he was putting out corn plots in the springtime, and he said, well, would you like to come out tomorrow on Saturday and help us put out corn plots? I said, I'd really be happy to. This would be good. So I saw the campus, and we went out to put on the plots. We got out there, and he said, can you drive a tractor? I said, well, of course. I'm a farm boy. He said, okay, you're going to be our tractor driver today. So uh, I got on the tractor, and I drove the tractor for, for those plots. And, and we put those plots out, and then we went back to Washburn and, and thinking about that then 
my major professor called and he said, we'd really like to have you come up here. And so he convinced me that maybe I ought to go to Iowa State. Well, after I arrived at the Iowa State that first summer, I was thinking about, I've never had entomology. What if I don't like this study of bugs? But I was really fortunate because he put me in a, um, a class that summer offered by a, a teacher by the name of Jean LaFoon, who was a very enthusiastic teacher in entomologist. And he got so excited about entomology that it rubbed off on me, and I suddenly realized that I could be excited about that as well. And then one of our graduate students one day was telling me, he said, uh, he said, Turpin, do you know why you got this assistantship? And I said, no, I don't. Uh, he said, it's because you could drive a tractor. Because <laughs> Don Peters always said, we're going to get that guy up here because he's a good tractor driver. And we need, and need, we him. need him on our plot. So he that, uh, and that was the beginning of the, uh, of the graduate career. And, and then I started working on corn rootworms, uh, which were soil insects. So I actually uh, moved over into the agronomy department, and I really have a, a double sort of major in agronomy and in entomology at, at Iowa State. But after the, the second year, I was in the second year, I was about to get drafted, and our local... Uh, this would be for the Korean War then? No, this is for the Vietnam, Vietnam War. War. Okay, Vietnam. And, uh, and so our draft board sent me the draft notice, and I was supposed to report for pre-induction physical. And I was right in the middle of a quarter uh, of school, and so I applied for a deferment to finish the school year. And they denied it. Uh, but then our county board denied it and said, no, show up for your pre-induction physical. So I appealed to the state board, and they granted it to the end of that, uh, that quarter. But nonetheless, I had to go for the pre-induction physical. And so I, I got down to, uh, to Troy, and, and they put me on a busload of, of young men who were headed to Kansas City for this physical. And I was the oldest one on there since I was uh, out of college. And so they, they put me in charge of the bus, which I didn't know what I was supposed to do, but they said, "What well, the bus driver will take you down here. Just make sure you keep these guys together. So I was kind of in charge. But when I got down to the pre-induction physical, I got all the guys off the bus, and we were standing where the bus driver told us to stand. And some little sergeant or something come running up to me and started chewing me out because my guys weren't standing in a straight line. And I said, well, nobody told me. He said, he said, soldier to be? He said, you ought to know that these boys have to stand in a straight line. And he said, I don't want this to happen again. At that point, I had kind of thought, okay, this is service to the country. And I suddenly decided that I'm not so sure I want to be treated that. You know, if somebody had told me that I was supposed to line them up, I would have been happy to do it. But not knowing what I was supposed to do and get chewed out for it, I'm not sure this is a lie for me. But I did go back to, uh, to Iowa State and I applied for a commission as an entomologist. Uh, and basically that I hadn't heard from them yet. And then uh, a, a, a school in Iowa had made contact with my college and they were looking for someone to be an assistant basketball coach and if he could teach science that would be great so they called me and said you know we can uh, give you a job teaching and my uh, draft board was deferring teachers so they said we can get you a deferment and I said that'd be good I said but I'm not a teacher I said that's all right uh, if you can teach uh, science and if you can coach, we'll get you a temporary certificate. But one catch, you have to start on a, uh, a career track to be a trained teacher. So I talked to my major professor and, and he said, you know, I think that'll work. He said, you can go coach and teach. You can come back up in the summer and take education courses and continue to do your research and we'll finish your graduate career that way so that's okay so so I did and I went to teach took courses for two summers I'm now have everything I need to be a secondary teacher except for one thing I never practiced taught so I've got all the courses everything I need and so then after the two years were up 
the, the war was beginning to wind down a little bit and I was not in danger of being drafted, I went back full time to Iowa State. But I went to the education board in the state of Iowa and I said, you know, I would really like to have the secondary certificate and I've taught math and I've taught science for four or for uh, four semesters for two years. Is there any way I can waive the requirement to practice teach? And they said, no. And I said, well, does it really make a lot of sense that I drop out of school for a semester so I can go practice teach and, and work for six weeks when I've had two years of full-time teaching? Uh, do you think I'll really learn anything? I mean, it seems to me I've practiced taught, you know, I've learned through trial and error what I need to do. And they said, well, the rules are the rules. And so I said, fine. There's no waivers. No <laughs> waivers, no waivers. So I'm not a certified teacher at this point, uh, but I, I do have some of the academic background. And sort of the sad part of this in a, in, a, in a way is that when I was teaching at this high school, I actually was assigned uh, student teachers from the University of Iowa. And I had two teachers each semester for eight semesters, one in math and one in science, that I supervised uh, as, for their practice teaching. And I actually, won an award as an outstanding supervisor for practice teachers. Now there are there are eight teachers out there that are illegal because their supervisor was not a certified teacher. <laughs> but we're not going to tell them that at this point. We'll just they're keep, doing very well. They're doing well, I'm sure, and I've been in contact with them and they're doing great. Right, but, uh, yeah. Sometimes bureaucracy is an amazing thing. <laughs> we move on, right? <laughs> yes, what, we do. Uh, what came next then? Did you, what were your career path before you came to Purdue? After you finished then, did you come to Purdue? I came uh, very quickly to Purdue Was after I finished up. I, f I finished up in 1971. My major professor uh, left uh, Iowa State to become department head at Oklahoma State, and we uh, were going to hire a new corn entomologist uh, for Iowa State. And as it turns out, they decided they really didn't want to hire their own students, even though some of the corn entomology people were being produced right there. And uh, they said, well, we don't want to hire our own students, but would you be willing to stay on for the next nine months to go through the field season uh, to get us past that because we won't get somebody hired in time? And so they, I technically went on the staff as assistant professor and then one of my first assignments was to hire somebody to replace me. So I was in charge of the committee to uh, recruit uh, uh, candidates to hire for corn entomology. You decided not to go to Oklahoma with your major professor? Or there wasn't well, I was finishing up. Oh, uh, see, I, I finished, finished my PhD, so I, I finished up before he left mm -hmm. and, uh, and basically then took over his job when he then moved to uh, Oklahoma State on a temporary basis. So I supervised interviewing candidates, they didn't find anybody they wanted. And so finally with the department head, they said, uh, uh, well, maybe we ought to change our attitude. Would you be interested in staying? And I said, well, you know, there's a job at Purdue that I know is coming up and I, I, I've already got my uh, application in over there and I'm going to interview over there in the next uh, few days. And I said, I really think if that comes through, that that'll be what I'll probably take. Uh, and and I interviewed without a lot of pressure because they now offered me the job at Iowa State, so I came over here knowing if this didn't work out, uh, then I could go back to Iowa State. And well, it did work out. Purdue made me an offer, and and then that fall I I moved to Purdue uh, in 1971, and I've been here ever since. Right. Were you married at that time? Yes. Did uh, you meet your wife at uh, who were at home? Well, I met my wife at the high school where I was teaching. Uh, her dad was a dairy farmer in that area, and uh, and she then uh, uh, was at Iowa State, and so we then ended up getting married after uh, after she came back up there, and so we we were married at that point, uh, and actually coming to uh, Purdue was kind of a traumatic experience for us because we lived in a trailer. I uh, I had a trailer that we'd moved up there. And two weeks before we were supposed to come, a tornado hit our trailer park and destroyed our trailer. And we were in it. Uh, and so we got tossed around in the trailer quite a bit. And, uh, so what few possessions we had in our life, we were able to salvage and put in the back of the pickup truck that I own. And we drove over here 
uh, in, the, in a pickup truck uh, to uh, start our life here. And my wife was still a student, so we were in a position where she could live in, in married student housing. So our first year here, uh, we lived in married student housing. I worked as a professor, and she was finishing up her, her degree. Okay. And the, then what, so now you're in the department. Tell us a little about your teaching and the research area, and then we'll move on to the bug bowl, how that came sure. out, too. Well, when I first got here, I was hired primarily in research. You were in the entomology hall at that time. Right? And we were in entomology hall, uh, and I moved in and doing corn research, and it was kind of bare bones in those days, and I can remember our department head, uh, John Osmond, um, and then he said, well, uh, you're going to, what will you need uh, to do your corn rootworm research? And I said, well, I, I need, a, I'll probably need a corn planter, and I, I would really like to have a pickup truck because we go to these plots all the time and, and we need a, a truck. And he said, well, we've got a pickup in a department. And we went out back and here was a probably a 1957 green old pickup sitting there. And he said, um, that's the departmental pickup and you can use it. And I sort of looked at John Osmond. I said, John, I, I don't think you understand that that I need a planter and a trailer and a truck that will pull this because we're, we're going to go out and we're going to test pesticides, we're going to do assessments of uh, ecological systems, and we need the equipment to get that done. And John sort of says, well, I don't know if we can afford all that. And I said, well, I think it's essential. So John got me a new pickup truck. And uh, and my the person I replaced on the on uh, here at Purdue handed me uh, a sort of a knapsack uh, with some unused insect net some unused insect nets and uh, and and note cards about where he discovered insects over the years. So my startup package, much different than you would get today, was a pickup truck and a bag with some insect nets in it, and said, "Here, kid, go out and solve the corn rootworm problem." <laughs> so, and we were in entomology hall. Uh, it was uh, the original ag hall at at Purdue University, and my office was at the end of the hall on the top floor. And it was. It looked like they just closed off the end of the of the hall and kind of uh, and made an office at the end. Well, the the door looked like it had had a hole chewed under it by rats. It looks like rats had chewed under that door. So as years went by and my students uh, would come to my office, it became kind of a joke uh, that if you uh, Turpin's office uh, has is the one with the the rat chew on the door. Can't miss it. You can't miss it. It's the end of the hall. And uh, I remember I was sitting in the office one day, and a, 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 an old man walked down the hall, tottered down on a cane, and he tapped on my door, and he said, Excuse me, do you mind if I come into your office? And I said, No, that'd be great. He came, I said, Sit down. He introduced himself, and he was a graduate of Purdue, and he said, You know, when I was here, my professor had this office, and my professor was the curator of the grain stocks here in the College of Agriculture. And he says, isn't it funny about the rat chew under the door? Because the rats chewed under his door to eat up the grain that he had stored in here. So now you know that. So it, and so as Paul Harvey would say, that was the rest of the story. It was a real rat chew that went back to the days that the grain was stored in, in that particular office. Oh. So that was your... Uh, tell One thing I want to ask you, you had the, the Latta games. What were those? Are they still going on? And Latta, was that named after Professor Latta? Yes. Is that where uh, came uh, from? We, actually, we started the Latta games. I... I had the opportunity to serve as uh, president of the Ag Alumni Association. I was always involved in the Ag Alumni Association, and I think to this day I'm the only non-Purdue graduate who ever served as the president of the Ag Alumni Association here at Purdue. But it was a real honor, and I, I worked. And Maury Williamson was the executive. Maury Williamson was the executive secretary, and Maury Williamson and I traveled many miles in this state, going to the uh, alumni meetings and. Uh, but part of it, we decided we needed to get kids interested in agriculture, and what could we do? So we started what, uh, a quiz bowl contest, like a college bowl kind of a thing, and, and ag alumni chapters around the state would uh, put teams together, and they would have a county contest, and then the county winners would come in 
to Purdue. We did it at state fair sometimes, and they would compete with each other on knowledge about agriculture. And that went for, oh, about oh, 10, 12 years, I think. And eventually they, they stopped doing it because it was hard to get uh, a place and things, and so they kind of gave up on it. But a number of those kids ended up then majoring uh, in agriculture here at Purdue, uh, and it was a great way to get them interested in the science of agriculture. And then having a visit as a part of it. When, and a visit it. here, and, and uh, they, they enjoyed it a lot. And they handed out awards, and I know one of the young men who was one of the, what, we had an all-star team. He's a science teacher now in an, for uh, a science magnet school in Florida. And he claims to this day he got his career because of uh, his interest at, uh, in science sure. at that point. So, sure. And that kind of grew out of a, another thing that I would started for the Entomology Society. I was very interested in keeping kids interested in what we were doing. And our, our scientific meetings were really kind of boring, I thought. Uh, you know, scientific papers are scientific papers, uh, but we didn't have a lot of fun stuff. So back in about uh, 1982, I proposed that we have a, a quiz bowl in the Entomology Society where college kids would compete on entomological information. And we started that that games, and, and that actually we call the, the Linnaean games, named, named after uh, Linnaeus, uh, person who started the system of binomial nomenclature and that was kind of the model for these latter games and so when when we decided we'd do the quiz bowl well we need to name it after somebody that would also be part of the educational process and so who would we name it after well the person who was so instrumental in getting this college of agriculture started in all aspects in research extension and in teaching was a fellow by the name of Latta, W.C. Latta. And so we decided we would call it the Latta Games uh, in, in sort of in his honor. And then the, the students had to learn about the history of agriculture at Purdue and who W.C. Latta was, uh, because that was always one of the questions in the game. Right. Well, you know, that was very good for them to know the background, the, how it came about. Exactly. The, the and, agriculture and, at Purdue. Yeah. And so that was the basis for that, uh, for that particular quiz okay. contest. Now you know when I move on to the, the Bug Bowl, how that came about and some com and how it's changed. Well, the bug bowl was an accident, uh, to be totally honest. Uh, I was always interested in teaching and, and popularizing uh, entomology for people who weren't interested in the subject. So I had, for years, had, had argued that we needed a popularized class in our department, not just a class for someone wanting to kill the insects on their crops or in their gardens, but someone who would learn about the role of insects in literature, in, in music, in art. And in life. And in life. And all the sayings associated, when we talk about putting a bug in somebody's ear, I mean, that's entomology. And so let, let's teach them and let's go across the, the street to humanities and, and get those people interested in what we're doing. And I said, we ought to have such a course. And so finally, the department head in those days, who was Eldon Ortman, said, all right, let's have such a course. Let's have it. I said, that's a great idea. I said, who's going to teach it? And he said, you are. Now you got to realize that all of my teaching here was uh, in pest management, which was my area, and it was in graduate education. I was primarily a researcher in pest management. Now I'm going to be teaching a class, a popularized class. That was kind of daunting. And so the beginning class, we needed seven students. That was the rule in the university then, had to have seven students. We advertised it, we talked to counselors, we went to the class that first day, and there were six students sitting there very sad. I counted them twice just to make sure. Only six. I said, do any of you have a friend that might want to be in this class? We need seven students. And they said, oh, I don't know. Just then, over an old entomology hall, a kid was walking along the sidewalk. And I pulled up the window and I said, young man, come in here. I need to talk to you. And lo and behold, he walked in the door. And he said, what do you want? And I said, we're having a class here and we need seven students and I know you don't have a class this hour because you're walking down the sidewalk would you maybe be interested in joining our class he said well I don't know what's the class and I said it's entomology and he said what's that and I said that's bugs and he he started to walk out and he said I'm an engineer I don't want to study bugs I grabbed him by the shoulder and I said would you sit down here let me tell you what this class is about At the end of the class I said 
are you sure you wouldn't like to sign up for that class? And he said, okay, I'll sign up. So he signed up. I had my seven students, and that was the beginning of the class. I hear from that engineer ever so often. He practices in Louisville nowadays, and I get notes from him, now emails or telephone calls occasionally. And he will say, you know, I was going down the street today, and I saw a bug, and I thought of you, so I thought I'd give you a call. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it grew uh, very uh, rapidly we went to 30 students and then there were 100 and then we had to move classrooms and ultimately we taught it every semester with uh, a field of about 470 students. But how was the tie-in with the uh, ang with the uh, Spring Fest? Well, uh, the tie-in was that uh, we tried to do outside class activities to keep them interested in entomology. So one night we were going to race cockroaches in Entomology Hall. And the students were doing it. And so the students from 105 came into my office one day and I now had an office over in what's called Whistler Hall and they had these marked cockroaches and they handed them to me and there was a news or a radio guy in there getting the latest corn rootworm recommendations and he said what are you going to do with those cockroaches I said well we're going to have a cockroach race tonight in entomology hall he went back to the radio here in town and he announced that guess what they're doing at Purdue tonight they're going to have a cockroach race and he invited the community to come over I didn't know he was going to do it, but all of a sudden, at the appointed time, my students from the class showed up, but families started walking in the door of Entomology Hall. We had 130 people from the community showed up that night to come to our cockroach races. And it suddenly dawned on me that there's not a lot to do in Lafayette, Indiana in the springtime, right? And so we thought, you know, if there would be a popular interest in doing some kind of interesting things like cockroach races, we ought to have an event. What are we going to call it? Well, how about Insect Fest? Oh, that's not very good. You know, we need something that will attract the attention of the press and something that is an alliteration that rolls off your tongue. Um, how about Bug Bowl? Because Bud Bowl was uh, a advertising campaign pain going on in those days so maybe we can do bug ball and oh you know bugs that's that's just not a correct term for insects no but we're we're meeting the public and most people think of insects as bugs so call it bug ball so we went to an event and we had 3,000 people the first year show up we had cockroach racing we had, basically it, we, we, we were over in entomology hall oh, and, inside inside oh, pretty right. much uh, and we had uh, we used the classrooms and, and we had uh, we cooked some insects and we had a petting zoo. We got out our oh my collections. We had the cockroach races and we didn't have a really fine racetrack in those days, but right after that we began to develop it with all the vignettes and, and now it's called Roach Hill Downs and, and, and it's traveled. We've been in some 30 states with it. We've been really around the country with it and all kinds of things. But it, uh, that was the beginning. Then we decided that, well, rather than... Well, at the beginning, the tiding was Spring Fest, that's the time well, you... That was, that was Bug Bowl by itself. Okay. But then uh, we decided that, well, look, Hort Show has, the next weekend has a program. Instead of let's being on this weekend, we just decided we would have ours on the same weekend as, as the Hort Show. And it made Hort Show people a little bit upset because they thought we were kind of encroaching on, on their territory until they counted their receipts that year for what they'd sold. They had over twice as many people than they'd ever had at the Hort Show. Because everybody who came to the Bug Show went to the Hort Show, the people went to the Hort Show, went to the Bug Show. So then I started talking to the dean and said, you know, uh, the vet school has an open house. Uh, why don't we have an agriculture event that's designed to bring in families and to promote what we do in a fun sort of a way? Well, we ended up calling it Spring Fest. And, now it's a lot more in agriculture. The whole university is involved. It really, and, it really has grown a lot. And also, they used to, didn't they used to call it Mother's Day weekend at one time? There were time, and then there was that that you know, you sing, and, and but it's all sort of morphed into what to we have. Today. What is now? It's all together in what we right. call uh, which, what we which call is spring really good. There's just it's all, great. It's all a, kinds of, like homecoming, and it's all kinds of activities. Well, see, so it used to be Gala weekend was the next weekend when right. the alumni came in and. And, and Grand it, Prix was tied in with it. And that. Grand Prix was tied in with it. But unfortunately, from the university perspective, and I know Martin Jiski and others uh, didn't like the, the image of 
Grand Prix. Uh, you know, it tended to be alcohol associated with the students and things. And they thought the image of Bug Bowl at Springfest was a lot better. This was family oriented. This was, right. and so they moved the gala weekend to join now what is Springfest because they, the alumni seem to be a lot happier with that. Uh, and there's a lot more things. And so many place. more things to do and see. So it's a massive weekend nowadays. Uh, but it's great. It's, it's great. great. It really it's great. Is. Yeah. So. And you got some highlights on that. Um, how about that uh, ins insect aganza? That uh, we want you to reach out to the community. Tell an us about that. Another outgrowth of the 105 class. Uh -huh. One of the things that we wanted to do in the 105 class was to give people who were interested in education an opportunity to uh, to hone their teaching skills. So we had a number of education majors in that class. And so they all had to do projects uh, to meet the requirements for the class. And so uh, we decided it would be really pretty neat if we could have our college students who are learning about insects teach kids and get them excited about insects. So we started inviting in uh, the local fifth graders. Uh, so we invite all the, the fifth graders in the county to come into what we call insectaganza. So why'd you have to select fifth graders? Because that's where they were teaching entomology okay. uh, in, the, in I'm their I'm thinking school. of that from the research. Why, why wouldn't you pick by that grade? Uh, mainly that's where they, they tend to do stuff with insects anyway. And okay. we've also found, and I've found in doing school programs, that that's an age group that is really excited about insects, excited about learning. You get them into junior high, they get, they get a little too cool to do things. So fifth, fourth and fifth graders are really a good target. And they're target sort of maybe a little bit curious too. Very curious, very excited. Uh, about things so we felt it was a good age group mm -hmm. plus many schools if they did anything on insects at all that's where they did it in the fourth and fifth grade. Are you st are still doing it? We're still doing it. Okay. Uh, we uh, depends on on the, the conditions and for example this year because of uh, travel restrictions a little bit we had less but we normally will have somewhere around 1300 uh, students somewhere between 1,000 and 1,300 fifth graders plus the associated chaperones and things that come in. It's a college experience. So the thing we want them to do, we want them to learn about insects. They go to a large class where there are I mean, 500 of them in the class. Then they go to small laboratories. And then they also have a quiz bowl where they study and then they compete. Schools compete with the quiz bowl. Uh, and it's just so the bells ring and they, uh, you know, just like college, you move to another class. And so <laughs> they're learning about Purdue. They're learning about insects. And the good part is that our own students are doing the teaching. We train them, we take them through training, and they teach insect dissection to all these kids. And so they have to learn to be a teacher. They have to come up with a lesson plan. They have to deal with a class of fifth graders for an hour. And it's a great experience for both educational groups. The, the young kids who are learning, our older college age students who are learning to teach. Are you still teaching your two courses? Or what courses are you still teaching? That you I'm teach not teaching the large class any longer. Uh, it's, it's still being going. It's, it's, still, it's still being taught. We've turned that over as I approach retirement to get younger people involved in it. Uh, I still teach um, at several sections of our insects in prose and poetry. I'm also teaching um, a honors class on insects and arts and literature. Uh, we've done that as part of the, the college honors program. And uh, I also am in doing a new teach, or new class that we're developing to train graduate students in agriculture and in science on how to do outreach education, how to deal with the media, how to write news releases, how to do an interview, uh, you know, how to teach fifth graders. And so we're training these students to do that. And then the second half of the class, they actually have a practicum uh, where they go out and they participate in this. And and I'm also, uh, we're also starting another thing that, that this fall in the honors program, we're actually uh, teaming up with theater and we're going to develop a, um, a modification of the Brothers Chopping insect play that was written back after uh, World War I, uh, all insect characters and things. We're, we're actually going to uh, use the honors class and the students are going to come up with a modern version and actually present a, uh, a, an insect to play. And, we're, and I'm visualizing from talking to some of them, I know that are gonna be in there that this is going to be fairly modern technology, maybe with, uh, at least where they're thinking now, maybe the actors will interact with, uh, with video characters uh, and all kinds of things. But this is pretty exciting because 
we want to tie uh, uh, sort of the humanities and the science together. And there'll be science kids and humanities kids that are working together uh, in this project. And ultimately, the goal of that will be that there will be a modification of that go to the Prague Quarterly, which is a contest of theatrical presentations uh, in about three years. So we're, we're beginning to design for Purdue's entry into uh, the Prague uh, theatrical competition uh, in three That's years. That's very exciting. It's exciting. It's really nice. It's, um, Talk about, uh, are you a fact fellow? Are you still a fact fellow at McCatchen? I No. Oh. Uh, I was a fact fellow for uh, uh, some 35 years. That's really changed. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a fact fellow at, at Tarkington. Yeah. Um, but it has changed. I, I interject that with the food thing, we Exactly. We really enjoyed going over there, and, and the students would come down, and we'd interact. But it's just it changed a lot. That's, that's but it's a it's a wonderful program, and I've, it's I, a great program. And I've we been with them a long time. I was with Meredith a number of years ago. We enjoyed it immensely. Had a great time. We always have the kids out to the farm and, sure. and go over there and have lunch. But the the lack of the food function because now you've got to go somewhere else to eat. We used to just go over and serve meals to them. Uh, and and almost always see some members of our floor when we were over there and we'd sit down. But now, I found it to become more difficult and and got busy and a lot of other things. So I said, okay, uh, it's, done it's it for changed. thirty some years. I've yeah, made my changed, contribution. It's really changed a lot, and we used to enjoy the, the uh, winter dances and oh, yeah. you know, a lot of yeah. the events. And we we still they still do the floors. We've done the judging on the floors, but one time we used to do it. Around Christmas time, we used to do the Christmas doors, and they sort of yeah. gotten away from that. Yeah. So that it, it has changed, so you don't do that any longer, but <laughs> it was a great experience. Yeah, we so. really enjoyed it. Um, talk about some of the awards and honors that you've gotten, certainly from etymology. You were the president, and then you've gotten some other awards. you want to make a couple comments on those for the researchers? Well, uh, some that stick in your mind. So, some of the awards, yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, it was—it's an honor for any entomologist or any scientist to serve as the um, as the president of their their society. I had the uh, opportunity while I was there to actually introduce uh, uh, some new activities, which are still there. Uh, for example, we now give a president's prize to an outstanding a grade school teacher and an outstanding high school teacher who incorporate insects into their teaching. And these two individuals uh, come to our national meeting, uh, get to uh, and are, receive the award there, uh, and get a chance to interact with entomologists and so forth. We have done at various times, and in, in, in my year as president, we did a, an outreach activity uh, where we brought uh, the grade school kids in in the community where we were that year. We were in Baltimore, brought busloads of them in, and the scientists then had a kind of a almost like a bug bowl kind of thing there. We actually had the cockroach racetrack there. And we've done that at various times uh, in the society where we bring in the kids. That's wonderful. To so you, you know, when you when I look back at the things that you share, you've done a lot of engagement, even before it really was, before it was really focused in more in the strategic plans and things, and outreach. I think that's right. We were we were doing outreach before outreach was cool, right. I think. And now it's, it's become uh, something that we think is part of what our mission is. In extension, we've always done outreach kind exactly. of things. We and the didn't call land it land grant. That. Yeah, right. that, yeah, that is a land grant mission. And That's so, right. yeah, so serving as president of society was was pretty it was pretty neat. I uh, eventually received the outstanding teacher award from our society, and that was really neat uh, as well. And I had uh, I did uh, receive the College of Agriculture's uh, uh, teaching award and and the university's Murphy Award uh, for as outstanding undergraduate teaching. And those things, I always feel like, are probably not totally justified, but nonetheless, I, I appreciate that students, especially students on the committees, could, could uh, recognize uh, what you're doing as a teacher is meaningful. And I think reason, and those teaching awards are, to me, the, the neatest things. I, uh, and at one point, I was the Indiana Case Professor of the Year, right. uh, and that was that was pretty very as well. A very special award, and, and Purdue has really done well in that arena. We've we've had a number. I think I maybe was maybe the third one, but we've had several since, since then. then. That's right. And uh, and that was that was neat because that recognizes across the universities here in the state of Indiana right. 
you know, people who are making contributions right. to the educational right. process. So, one thing I wanted to ask you: um, you're, have you are you still full time? Uh, yeah, full-time? I'm still full time. Uh, I I'm just just, te- just am not uh, teaching the big class anymore. Okay. We're doing a lot more stuff right now in terms of teacher education. Okay. Uh, I'm involved in the. Um, uh, Jerry, the, the Gifted Education Research Institute and the Teacher Training Program. We're doing lots more efforts in trying to get our outreach into the educational system for uh, public education because we're at a limit as a department what we can do ourselves. There's just so many hours in the day for the few of us interested in outreach. So what we're trying to do is train uh, sort of the teachers to carry our outreach message. and. We were talking about uh, you know, the columns and things and putting on podcasts. Uh, I just recently cooperated with the, uh, the State Library Association. We made a, uh, a uh, basically a CD uh, called Catch the Reading Bug to promote the Catch the Reading Bug program that the, the National Library Associations had last year. And it's been distributed in some 30 states. And the local librarian uh, uh, down at the Typical New Library and I were the main characters in there with a class of students that, uh, from one of my students' uh, classes that were the, the class of students that we dealt with. And, and this was used to say, uh, you can learn a lot about insects by reading about them. And I had the live insects, and so the sort of the stick in the, in the video was that the entomologist had a live insect and the librarian always had a book where you could learn about it as well. So if you can't have an entomologist with a live insect, the be- next best thing is to read about it in a book. Get the know. book there, right. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that and, and we're now doing um, uh, class training things through other programs, uh, zip trips here at Purdue. We've done some entomology stuff. I've helped them with uh, biology kind of things. Uh, I do a number of things. There's a new program through public TV and they've done some uh, science education, and uh, we've interacted with Rick Claus, uh, uh, Crossland down there is the, the media person to develop these. And so we're looking for ways to get our information out where we don't personally have to be there. And so yeah. that's where our emphasis is And the is technology now. is there to, to enhance that and be able to do it exactly. in a nice and effective manner. Exactly. Right. And we'll be doing more uh, school programs uh, through the magic of uh, TV in their room and, and here. So we're beginning to develop those. And so that's kind of in the, the last time sort of I spend in the university as an official staff member and devoting my efforts to trying to put in place uh, the, the more of the teacher training kinds of things. Very so good. I'm devoting my effort to that. That's nice. Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition in an outstanding event? I usually ask people that. Uh, well, uh, I don't have a, a, a really uh, a favorite tradition. I, you know, I, I think now uh, what is becoming a tradition, which is ultimately going to be my favorite, is Spring Fest. And, and people now tell you that this is a Purdue tradition. And the reason I think it's so neat is because, you know, I was there. I was part of it. And so now here, and if you read the Purdue traditions, sometimes Bug Bowl is listed as a tradition. Right. And so it's kind of neat to be able to tell your grandkids or whatever. Say, and it's not new ones come along. New, and, new traditions, and they are coming, should, and they should, and, and exactly. Uh, but I, you know, I, I love the uh, the traditions uh, with with uh, uh, say the, the Reamers and the Boilermaker Special, and uh, and we have the Boilermaker Special out to our house when we have the, the Salvation Army children come out and the Boilermaker, and they ride on it, and they honk their horn and scare the cows and the sheep. And, and, and the kids that run it, I'm, I'm a, you know, an honorary in the, in the Reamers. And, and I think the traditions associated with that, I, I've really had a good time with. Right. How about an, do you have an outstanding event that comes to mind? An outstanding event uh, at Any the university? Or it, not necessarily, whatever comes to mind. You have one. Well, you know, to me, uh, an event that, that I dearly love outside the university is the State Fair. And I've been involved in the State Fair from day one when we got here, first uh, in the Pioneer Village with Maury Williamson and, and reenacting things there. And now for the last 20 years, we've run the cockroach races at the um, Pioneer Ourland Pavilion, which is another Pioneer building. And that's become a state fair tradition. We threatened a couple years to, to not be able to go because we were short on 
people to do it, and, the, and they threw a fit and said, no, no, we, we've got to have the cockroach races. But it, it's such a neat way to meet the public. Yeah. And, uh, and people in the state as well. And the, in the state as well. They come in, and they, and I, I have to, just have to tell the story, but one of, and I think she may be deceased because I haven't seen her in the last couple of years, but one fairly elderly lady, about every year when I would call the cockroach races at the state fair, would come and sit in the front row and complain about the ridiculous aspect of racing cockroaches. And she would say things like, I don't understand why Purdue wants to do this sort of stuff and would complain about it, and every year she came back <laughs> to, to be to part, voice her. To, to voice her complaint about it. But she didn't just voice her complaint, she sat there and watched it each time, you know. But it made the point to me that even if you don't like this sort of stuff, you've got an opportunity to reach people. And That's my, what's key. And my greatest, my greatest compliment always as an outreach person has always been in my mind is that when somebody will come up to me after a cockroach race or after a lecture in class or whatever and will say about something that we maybe covered that day, that I didn't know that. And and my comment is, that's why we do this, you know. You know, giving you an opportunity to learn new things. And one of the inspirations for me, and it kind of gets back to your heritage too, is a woman by the name of Annie Dillard. Annie Dillard wrote Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, and, and one of my high school friends, uh, grade school friends actually, was back one day, and he said, he said, have you ever read Pilgrim at Tinker Creek? And I said, no, and he said, you need to read it. So I went and got it and read it, and one quote in there is, she said, today I saw a praying mantid egg case for the first time, and now I see them everywhere. To me, that's the greatest commentary on education I've ever heard. Now, I don't know how, and I've talked to Annie Dillard a couple of times, and I've not asked her this question. I need to do it. You know, how she learned to see a praying man in a case. Was it in reading a book? Was it somebody showed her that? But nonetheless, it was education. She learned it by watching it on TV or something. And all of a sudden, now that she knows what that looks like, she then looks around nature, and they're everywhere. She now sees them there. And that's what education is about. You teach someone something, they then can see this it opens the it world. opens the the world to them you know and the more you know the more you see you know right. from the sagebrush ocean the more you know the more you see so once you've learned that it opens the world to right. you. and and that's what we've tried to do with insects all along was but if you tell people we're going to have a lecture on insects nobody will show up but if you say we're going to have bug bowl and it's going to be fun they all show up we, we sugarcoat the education for them. Got to use your right terminology. Yeah, that's exactly right. Be and creative. That be creative. And, and, you know, people who have a problem with insects come to our meetings because they want answers to their question. But 99% of the people don't necessarily have a problem they're seeking answers for. And their attitude about insects is kind of a yuck. In fact, in the most recent book, I, uh, I pointed out that uh, we hope, in the introduction, I said, I hope that for everybody who reads this book, well, we'll then have you know, sort of a, uh, an awakening like a young kid with a magnifying glass that looks at a insect for the first time. And they may say, oh, that's neat. I've never seen that. But they might say, oh, yuck. So I say the purpose of the book is to open your eyes and, and oh, that's neat is great. But an oh yuck will do, you know. <laughs> but what you're trying to do is is build on their attitudes and expand their education. Right. You know? Yes. And Any closing comments? And I think you uh, for the that you want to share or anything topic particular to come back to anything special? Well, not really. I, I I guess one of the thing one of the opportunities I've had at, at Purdue was to do all kinds of different things. And one that most people would think is kind of surprising was that a couple years ago, we opened a new theater called the Handsome Theater. Uh, the director of the play came over one day and he said, would you be willing to have a role in that play? I said, well, I'm not really an actor. He said, I've seen you teach. I think you could do it. I said, well, I don't know. It doesn't take a lot of work. And he said, yeah, 
takes a lot of work. But he talked me into it, and it was a George Aid play. You may be familiar with it, The College Widow. And the I, opening play. The opening play at in the, the Hanson Theater. And I played the role of Peter Witherspoon, who was the president of the university. And that president was actually modeled by George Aid on a former Purdue president who he didn't like very well. So I did research and uh, kind of what would this character have been like trying to figure out what my role was going to be. And so I learned a lot about the history of the university. But what an opportunity for an entomologist to learn about how the theater works, to, to walk out on that stage and see the people out there, you know, and realize this is not what I'm all about, you know, kind of a thing. You know, did the best I could. <laughs> Had a good time. Enjoyed it. Uh, and enjoyed it immensely. Uh, but, but what an opportunity, you know, to, and, and Purdue is that way for a lot of people, you know, that uh, you, can, you can have all kinds of different things. And people said, well, are you glad that yeah, you came to Purdue? And I must always say I've never regretted a moment of it. We've enjoyed every second we've been over here. Thank you. That's very good. Thank you, Dr. Herbert. Very good. I agree.